This episode of Haunted Cosmos is brought to you by The Psalms Project, the 10-minute Bible Hour podcast, and our supporters at patreon.com. Did you know that patrons get early access to ad-free main episodes, as well as an exclusive weekly show, The Dusty Tome? Support the show today and get these benefits and more. And now, on with the show. As the NIDS era of Skinwalker Ranch drew to a close, and Bigelow Aerospace began to lose the bandwidth necessary to manage such a massive investigative undertaking, the ranch went up for sale for just the fourth time in its history. A Delaware-based holding company, Adamantium Real Estate LLC, owned by Brandon Fugel out of Salt Lake City, Utah, was chomping at the bit to purchase the ranch. After some negotiations and due diligence required by some strange clauses in the purchase contract, It had been a government research facility after all. The purchase was finalized and the ranch entered the era of Fugel's ownership. When reflecting on his first visits to the famed ranch, Fugel said the following, quote, I found nothing unusual about the property other than on that first tour, we noticed something unusual about the fence line perimeter. These body parts were hanging from the fence line, animal bladders that were blessed and hung for the purpose of keeping the demonic spirit entities on the property. Apart from that obvious bit of horrifying detail, Fugel would double down and confirm that even the disinterred animal bits hanging from the fence wasn't enough to give him the creeps. It was just common Navajo practice. In fact, Mr. Fugel considered himself, if he had to pick, more of a scully than a molder, more of a skeptic than a believer. However, he won't deny that he's always been the type of skeptic that remains interested in finding out who's right. This was the primary motivator in his purchase of the ranch. He wanted to know who was right about it all. That, and he was overwhelmed by the ranch's undeniable and surprising beauty. But while on one of his many routine visits to the ranch, before and closely following the purchase, Mr. Fugel's eyes would be opened, so to speak. All previous visits had been completely normal. Nothing strange had occurred. No weird vibes had been felt. Nobody had left and ended up haunted by a sleep paralysis demon. So far, so boring, Fugel must have thought. But then he got out of the helicopter on this one visit. He and his brother, who had piloted the aircraft, began walking the perimeter of the fence line, looking up at the infamous Skinwalker Ridge when they saw it. Against the pale blue sky that had been empty before, now lingered a black disc. Wide and flat, the uncanny thing moved across the sky at impossible speeds and trajectories until, just as abrupt as its arrival, it vanished into the blue. Mr. Fugel was in for it. On August 21st of 2019, three years after he purchased the ranch, Fugel sat down around a long wooden table in a surveillance trailer on the property. He was surrounded by a team of hand-picked researchers who were eager to share the news he had made the emergency trip down from Salt Lake City for. Principal researcher Eric Bard had called him in to see something strange he had noticed while reviewing the footage from the wide array of cameras now peppering the ranch. You see, the day before, something weird had happened. Skinwalker Ranch had experienced, for the first time in three years, the death of one of her cattle. Now sitting at this table with the ranch's owner, Mr. Bard thought he knew the reason it had happened. The day before, at 3.41 p.m., Dr. Travis Taylor, another lead researcher from the University of Alabama, was called down to the eastern field of the ranch. A cow had died. When Taylor arrived, he immediately went into action, scanning the area for strange or otherwise unexpected levels of radiation. What he found was shocking. In the immediate area surrounding the cow, the background microwave radiation was measuring 20 milliwatts per centimeter squared. The amount you'll experience standing two inches from a closed microwave while it's running is one quarter of that. Additionally, he found that all other frequencies in the background spectrum had risen by orders of magnitude. In other words, all forms of background radiation had spiked up so that now the area was akin to standing in front of dozens of x-rays all running at the same time. Meanwhile, 
the ranch hands went looking for the rest of the herd. Every last head of cattle had abandoned the dead cow by dozens of acres, as far as the eye could see across the flat basin. Eventually, they found all 41 heads clustered in a corner of the ranch they had hardly ever been before. They went from the eastern grazing field to the far western corner of the western field for seemingly no other reason than whatever it was that had killed their brother cow. After the radiation levels reduced by diffusing into the air, the team called a vet in to perform an autopsy. As he slashed the thick hide and snapped the rib cage with branch loppers, a gentleman named Thomas Winterton, the ranch manager, looked on with curiosity. He had seen his fair share of dead cows getting cut up by a vet, but this time was different. This time he couldn't stop thinking about the old legends of cattle mutilation on the ranch. He had read the stories, he had looked at the pictures, but it didn't really sink in until now. This seasoned animal vet was pouring sweat after 40 minutes of sawing at this animal's bones, having to deal with the horribly imprecise cuts and breaks that naturally come from an animal not tied down, free to shift and roll all along the grass. Thomas was left speechless. How could the cattle from the stories have been drained of all their blood, suffered the most perfect cuts and incisions imaginable, suffered no broken bones, and all under 20 minutes with no evidence of tampering left behind? Before he had finished processing this realization, the vet gave his diagnosis. Stress, he said confidently. The cow died of acute stress-induced pneumonia. Stress? What was there to be stressed about? When Mr. Fugel heard the news, he dropped everything and drove down. He was met by Eric Bard upon arrival. With an almost childlike sense of urgency, Eric ushered him into the trailer to view what he had just found. You see, there had been a camera pointed right towards the area where the cow had died the day before. And Eric showed the footage capturing the cow's final moments. After all the other cows had fled, in one final desperate act, the beast lifted its head as if trying, straining, to stand up. Of course, it didn't work. The cow failed to stand and flee. The head dropped and the cow died, presumably from acute high-level stress. This in itself, while macabre, was not necessarily profound. That is, until Eric followed the line of sight of the animal. When he did, he noticed something contrasted clearly against the pale blue of the Utah summer sky. A black object, wide and short like a disc. It had only been captured within a couple of frames. It was so fast. But there was no denying it was there. And there was no denying that on the surface at least, it appeared the cow saw it too, right before he dropped dead. Welcome to Haunted Cosmos. Before I say anything else, I realized the other day that I've been saying welcome to the Haunted Cosmos podcast. Yeah, you're confusing everybody. And it's just, that's not the name of the thing. Although so, our website is thehauntedcosmos.com. Yeah, I know. We're, but that's because Haunted Cosmos was taken. And then our email is Haunted Cosmos podcast. <sighs> it's Haunted Cosmos, okay? That's what it is, people. Let's, that's the, let's just be the Cosmos. definitive word. Anyway, my name is Ben Garrett. I am your illustrious host. Okay. So true. I don't know what that means. But I'm your host, joined by my co-host, Brian Sovey. So good to be here, Ben. Yeah. With you, here in this room. Here in this room with Man. our pitchers of water. With our pitchers of water, our Bigfoot mugs. Our, our uh, Make sure you pick up some merch, guys. Go to the website. Yeah, pick the up store, some merch. Thehauntedcosmos.com. We've got some... To car, smash the like, in smash the subscribe button. While we're shamelessly <laughs> promoting, Ben... Tell, tell the people, we've got this flourishing community oh, that's of true. haunted cosmonauts. Tell people how to join. And yeah. there's some sweet benefits that come with patronage. Yeah, that's true. So we try to make the patronage of this show extremely valuable to mm -hmm. people. So what we do is when you sign up to be a patron, you get the first or second half of whatever season we're in immediately available to you. Yeah, like five episodes at a time. Five episodes immediately available. You can binge listen. And then we also give you access to a signal chat group. And then I'm working on a Discord uh, server yeah. as well where all the other patrons are there. You can discuss. You can have these... Some of, the, some of the most crazy things I've ever read in my life yeah, have uh -huh. been on this. So true. Uh, so if you want, if you're interested in that, that's another perk. And then also the biggest perk to me. This is the this is the coolest part. This is the best. Is every week you get a patron only episode of our Dusty Tome show. Yes. And what that is is uh, just other stories, whether it's listener submitted or stuff that we found online and we're like, this is cool, but for whatever reason, we're not going to do a main show about it, at least not yet. 
Um, then we'll put it on the dusty tome and you'll hear it. And it's like, there's music in the background. Same and, vibe. Yeah. Same vibe. And, and it's wonderful. So if you've listened to like lore with yeah. Aaron Mankey, I, actually, I'm sorry. I'm Baron Spanky. Baron Spanky. this is Chore. I'm Karen Hankey. Where he tells lib stories. Yeah. Because he's lib. Because he's an L. Um, the thing is, it's every bit as good as Lore. And Lore is like the biggest podcast yeah. in the 14 space. So, there, I mean, yeah. I'm not even kidding. I think the Dusty Tome is a great show. Yeah, it's a really fun show. They're usually a little shorter, like 20 to 30 minute episodes. Uh, yeah, every every patron level gets access to the Dusty yep, Tome. Every, and the, then the Sasquatch photographer right. tier and up. <laughs> yeah. So, we yes. have what we have is the conspiracy theorists. Yeah. That's the 595 tier a month. They get Dusty Tome and Signal Chat access yep. and Discord when we get it. The the uh, Sasquatch photographer mm -hmm. yep. gets Dusty Tome early shows and signal chat. Yep. And then the top tier, which is the Cryptid Hunter, Cryptid Hunter <laughs> gets, they get all that stuff, but then they also get a free piece of merch. You send them merch. Every, every few Like a couple times months. a year, we're sending them free merch. Yeah, so usually when we about get a new line out. Once a quarter, we'll send them a, a shirt or yep. a mug. Um, and hook them up. So, and, and here's the thing, guys. Like, 1095 months, you're like, oh, that. I mean, but think about it. We're giving you four bonus shows on average. Yep. Two main shows, early access, and it's like going to Starbucks twice. Yeah. I mean, once if you're a basic white girl getting a pumpkin <laughs> spice, a vintage pumpkin spice latte or whatever. V they vintage? A venti? Vin venti. Vin you used vin to work there. Stop playing dumb. <laughs> what are you talking about? We I actually <laughs> regularly said back people's orders like that. I was saying, all right, a vintage pumpkin spice latte just to see how far I could change it before they would notice and like people never said They're something. like, what is that? Does it just like, like, this smell so dusty? Does it smell old? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. But Ben, enough about us. Yes. Let's talk about, let's talk about some stuff. Let's talk some about stuff. why we're here. Let's talk about a mysterious haunted ranch yeah. in northeastern Utah. Here's the thing. You know why you're here. We know why we're here. What we're doing tonight is concluding our investigation of the enigmatic Skinwalker Ranch. Oh, and so we are true. focusing, it is enigmatic, okay, at the very least. Mm -hmm. And we're focusing tonight on the current period of ownership, the Fugal era. It's owned by Brandon Fugal. He bought it in 2016. And he still owns it today. Friend of the show, Brandon Fugel. Yeah, we're trying to make that. And when I say friend of the show, I mean, I'm going to stalk him on Twitter and yeah. hope he responds to me. And hey, by the way, listeners, spam Brandon Fugel on Twitter. Tell him. Tell him to listen to Haunted Cosmos. Yeah. We, we would love, he's a Mormon, so we would love, A, to share the gospel with him, B, yeah. to get him uh, like a Mountain Dew or something. Yeah. he's like, a Mormon. Have a Mountain Dew with him. Yeah. Uh, and then... We really want him to invite us to the ranch. We want to go <laughs> hang out Dragon, who is not, not he's a person. Yeah, You're he's, gonna find he's out. a guy. He's we not We want to hang out with him. And uh, as, in fact, we said part three, but this is ongoing. Like, we could do a part four at yeah, some point. Oh, my gosh. Because yeah. the investigation Cause the, it's continues. Still going. Yeah, I'm sure Dusty Tomes will include a lot of Skinwalker stuff. That's so true. As we keep going. So stay tuned for that. But anyway, to review, in part one, we discussed the first owners of the ranch, the Sherman family. Well, they they got it from the Myers family, who were truly the first owners. Mm -hmm. But the Shermans were the first ones to at least uh, document all the weird stuff that was going on. And then in part two, we talked about the NIDS investigation and in Bigelow Aerospace, owned by Robert Bigelow, and their investigation of the mysterious ranch. We discussed some of the major difficulties they had in the investigation. Yeah. Specifically that precognitive sentient intelligence where it was almost like the ranch was messing with them. Yeah. Trying to make it hard for them to collect data. Just trickster stuff. Right. And then we left you hanging a little bit as to what the next era of the ranch would look like. So in this show, we want to really emphasize the common denominators that are linking the three eras together. So we'll talk about what has changed or evolved, like the the different phenomena, how they've gotten different, but more importantly, we think, what has stayed the same? Yeah. What has remained consistent? And then we'll also further explore the pagan implications of the land. Remember, this is a Navajo land, and this whole thing started with the curse of the skinwalker that the Navajo supposedly placed on this property. So when you get into that, you start to get into really occult practices. You start to get into like nexuses of, of dark portals and nether worlds and stuff. And hey, we'll get there when we get there. But, we'll get there when we get there. Yeah. And then lastly tonight, it is part three. It's, it's our final main installment for now. We're going to give our takeaways, our own yeah. conclusions as to, you know, what do we think is going on? Uh, what do we think should be the Christian response? How, what's our speculation? Yeah. Like, we're going to get a little unhinged, but hopefully not too unhinged. It'll be like hinged. It'll be. Hey, we'll make a distinction. Hey, it's going to be slightly hinged. Slightly we'll, we'll, unhinged. We'll say like, hey, 
this is what we think and this is right. what we know. Yes. And, and there's yes, a difference. Yes. You got to make a distinction, it's guys. A distinction. You always got to make a distinction. What is certainty versus what is opinion? That's right. So, so true. Moving on, I do want to give some reaction to the cold open story. Yeah. So, what we have, uh, first, let me go through the players. All right. So, we have. Yeah, let's get that clear. Brandon Fugel, he's a real estate mogul in Salt Lake City. He is a very, very wealthy man. Um, and he funds the current research that's going on on Skinwalker Ranch. Now, he doesn't live on the ranch. He he has multiple other companies that require his attention. So what he's done is he's hired a team of investigators to go do the work for him. These, these include people like Eric Bard, who's the principal investigator. He's kind of the, the main manager of the scientific aspect of what's going on. And then he also has brought on, and this was somewhat spurned by the History Channel creating a TV show on it, mm-hmm. Dr. Travis Taylor. Now, Travis Taylor is a astrophysicist from the University of Alabama. He's a genuinely credentialed guy, mm-hmm. um, and he's worked on many, many top-secret government contracts. So he's there to help them solidify the experimentation. Yeah, continue the in the spirit of NIDS to really rigorously follow a scientific method, attempt to find repeatable, documented, scientifically valid... Yep. Information and data on what's going on. They're really same idea as NIDS, just now with no longer 1990s technology. Yeah, now you have more up to date stuff. Much, I mean, the gulf between 90s technology and today's is so huge. It is massive, and it, which sounds crazy, but that's how quick the like camera technology and well, pe- things. Yeah, is people don't give that enough credit. Drones, <laughs> yeah, I mean, drones, all, all Light, sorts. Lidar, lidar, lidar is huge. Lidar is huge. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. I mean, so same spirit. Yeah, and then uh, just a few other people. So so Dragon, he doesn't really. We're, Dra- we're not really going to talk about him. He's just cool. Uh, I just he, he and he's called Dragon. If you watch the show, Dragon is like he's so intense. A character who's there for the drama. Yeah, his name's Bryant, and he is it really. And he literally, dude, in season one, episode one, he introduces himself to to Doctor Taylor as, "Hey, uh, you can call me Dragon." Like gives himself the name for it's yeah. He's like, just so you know. It'd be like if if I walked up to you and I was like, "You can call me the Red Power Ranger." They call me John Slade. <laughs> My name is. <laughs> That's a psych reference. If anyone gets it. My name is Luke Skywalker. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> My name is Ben Vader. But he, he's always like full up tactical. Yeah, I mean, he's like, got like the body armor. He's got like anyway, an AR fifteen or a shotgun. I at cannot all times. stress enough. We don't talk about him. No, we don't. Just, but he's the main. He has main, he's character, main character energy. That's true. His life is the, is the main storyline. And then the last guy I'm going to mention is by name is Thomas Winterton. Thomas Winterton is <laughs> Brian's laughing because there's this. <laughs> this is so stupid. Ben Ben does the most perfect impersonation. Of, All right, let's of, get it out of, of the way. Of Doctor Taylor. Doctor Taylor. He's from, he's from Alabama. Alabama. He's from Huntsville. Let's get <laughs> let's it get out of the way. Go this ahead. is what he does. Doctor Taylor always goes. <clears throat> Remember, I was raised in Georgia, so I know Dr. He Taylor, does okay? Thomas Winterton and I went over to the Mesa to see what's going on here at Skinwalker Ranch. I can't. It's, it's so perfect. So I mean, like, corporate needs to tell you the, the difference between these two pictures. They're the same picture. It's the same picture. So anyway, oh. Thomas Winterton and I, and he, oh. and he is the... He's actually, like, the ranch manager. So yeah. if you remember from NIDS... The NIDS episode, they kept the ranch function. They kept Sherman on. Yeah, Terry. they kept Sherman on to manage the cattle and everything. So Fugle's uh, doing the same thing. By the way, I'm pretty sure I called him Tom through the whole episode. Yes, uh, uh, his one. name is Terry, isn't it? Well, it, they they gave him a they gave yeah. him a pseudonym of Tom Gorman. Tom Gorman, and yeah. I like mixed them together. I'm pretty sure through the whole. You did. Part. I remember it was. We kept calling him. I did too. Tom Sherman. Tom Sherman. His <laughs> name is Terry Sherman. Terry and Gwen. You, anyway, you but know, they kept. You know who we're talking about? We, yeah, they're following. So anyway, Thomas Winterton and I, and <laughs> and he is the ranch manager. So he just makes sure everything's going smooth on the ranch but like you know he's he's like the he's the deacon he like literally does everything yeah yeah, yeah. um like he digs and and if, he, if there's like heavy machinery a road to be graded yeah, yeah. Cow- or, i mean or, fence to be I mean, mended. a rocket to be set up he's wearing cowboy boots and a cowboy hat he's a, he's a thick calloused hand tough guy i'll tell you what he knows is, his man. business he's a chad king he's a chad king he's let's chad call it king. let's call it what it is let's call it what it is all right and in fact friend of the show <laughs> Friend of the show, Thomas, Thomas Winterton, Winterton. Friend of the show. Come hang out with us. We we'll, would we'll love, hang out with you. Invite yeah. us down. We would love to go on location. Dude, we would love Yeah, let's shoot our shot. We'd go like, prayed up. I mean, we would we'd freaking be, we'd be so respectful. Full armor of God. We would not take any pictures. 
I promise. Well, probably. No, we wouldn't, Brian. We wouldn't. It would be just for us. Unless and selfish. Unless we were allowed to. Unless we. Well, yeah. I mean, come on. So yeah, good point. The last thing I'll say before we uh, reflect on the cold open a little bit more. Yeah. Is I know I can already see the messages in the in the tweets and the twitters. Oh, uh, it's a show on History Channel. Like this is all fake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. First of all, I hear you. And I understand. Hey, there is the alien meme guy. There's, there's ancient aliens. Rick Hot. And they have to recover from that reputation. Yep. I understand why you we say that. But here's the deal. And also, just by the way, it is the same producers as ancient aliens. Like, same guys are making like, those uh, shows. Uh, 100%. And so you know what? It. They had fun with it, though. But let me let me just quote Brandon Fugel, okay? Brandon Fugel, yeah, it says that he agreed to the show as long as, quote, nothing was fabricated or contrived, and I could use my own team who I trusted. So... Fugel hired all of his own people. He did not let History Channel hire anyone. Fugel had to sign off on anyone they recommended personally. And then he also, part of the contract of the show is that they can't make anything up. They can't doctor any footage. They can't create Mm -hmm. hoaxes. Everything has to be legitimate. Everything has to be authentic. Yep. At least the only way that it would happen is if they were tricking Brandon Fugel. Yeah, That's what. So... Which the I doubt. conspiracy, we'd have to go deep. Yeah, you'd have to go really deep. So I just want to get that out of the way first. This is just like NIDS. Like, this is a legitimate investigation. I, and I get the sense as well that Dr. Taylor and Thomas Winterton and I... And Eric Bard, too. That they would not be interested in faking stuff. No, no, no. I mean, like, he's got... Like, Eric Bard is like a classic nerd. Yeah, he and he's a legit... Like, he's a physicist, too. Yeah, they're they all... all have... Except Thomas Winterton or not. They all yeah. have PhDs. <laughs> yeah. And, like, they're really serious about this yeah. stuff. And then Thomas Winterton, like, he's just a rancher, so he's just kind of along for the ride. Yeah. All right. With all that said. All that said. All that said. The cold open. Yeah, let's talk about it. So here's why I brought it up. I think that it does a good job of linking the common denominators. You have, just like what Nid said, anytime there's UAP phenomena, look at animal mutilations. Mm -hmm. So here we have, and it's not necessarily a mutilation, but the mysterious death of a cow that was stress-induced, like, yeah. per the vet, he's like, yeah, this was acute stress. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, what could it have been? He's like, I don't know. And then they see this this UAP dart across the sky in the footage. So it's linking those things together. And then I also just want to point out something that will come up more. Mm-hmm. And that is that after they found the cow, one of the other security guys was like, hey, let's treat this like a crime scene. Right. It's a good idea. He's like, you got no one touch anything. Let's yep. take pictures. Yep. And so they all kind of backed off, and he's taking pictures of the cow to make sure that stuff's documented. Yep. And as he's doing that, his phone starts to go berserk. Like crazy. Like it starts to buy stuff. It like cancels his camera. It deletes images. It like deletes emails. It's and opening sends. apps. Like it's o- doing all closing this stuff. apps. He's like, this has never happened before. And then he, when he steps away from the cow, it stops. And, and not only did it do that, but it did that through a secure enclave. Some, it, multiple times in the show. We'll yeah, so there was another thing where they were up on the mesa. On the mesa? Up on the mesa. And, and they're down in this pit, and the guy, like, his phone was locked. Yeah, like security locked. And, like, off. And it turned on, unlocked, passcode entered. He did none of this. Right. It, the, the, the difficulty of hacking into an iPhone is actually very high. Mm-hmm. And it did it. It was like, boop. Got like through inst- all of it. Instantaneously. Which was crazy. And then starts doing crazy stuff. So it kind of, you know, is akin to yeah. all of the instrumentation being fiddled with by whatever force yeah. is, uh, is uh, what's the word, like manipulating things yeah. on the ranch. What, what, interesting as well. We didn't mention, we held some things back in Nid's episode, but one of them was instrument uh, and magnetic interferences. Yeah. Where their compasses would spin. They would have magnetic and, and, and other instrumentation anomalies just over and over. But then again, 90s all the way now to in the late 20 teens, the instrumentation has shrunk. It's handheld. They've got tri-field meters. Yeah. They've got all sorts of instrumentation, very powerful and weird stuff. Yeah, weird stuff. Weird stuff happens. And then some of the other things that happened that are really alarming, but that we won't get super deep into... But that is important. So Thomas Winterton, he has worked on the ranch since Fugles owned it in 2016. Yeah. Now, the show didn't start till 2019. So there's three years of investigation that we actually don't know much about. 
And we've been watching this show and since we've before Haunted Cosmos. Yes, we've been watching it. We love the show. It's a really good yeah, show. Yeah, it is really good. It's just a bunch of guys having a big old time. It's just also, a bunch of dudes being guys. There's genuinely weird stuff. And uh, so Thomas Winterton had this thing where he was digging on the ranch. And that's a whole theme where... Like, everyone's afraid of disturbing the earth around the ranch. Yeah, you remember, allegedly, the contract. Yes. Tell, tell us. Uh, so, allegedly, the contract that the Shermans had to purchase the ranch from the previous owners, that family that owned it for 60 years, said... The Myers. You, the Myers. You yeah. must notify us if you're going to dig yes. before you do. Like, like why? why? And, like, there's, there's, there's questions as to whether or not that's real. But no matter what, the perception is among all the investigators that digging on their ranch is somehow dangerous and it seems that it was backed up because one time Thomas was doing some digging and he suddenly got this piercing headache yep like piercing headache so bad that he had to stop working and he actually had to get escorted to the hospital mm -hmm. because he couldn't I mean he could barely walk he's like am I having an aneurysm he said that he couldn't Stroke. see anymore like imagine a migraine that's the worst thing in the world and you like can't see anymore yeah he goes into the hospital. They take an x-ray of his head. And there's this contusion, this like, this weird thing that's growing on the back of his head, almost like someone had injected water in between his skull and his, like, skin. And the doctors were saying that it could kill you. Like, if you hadn't have come in, this 100% could kill you because they, mm -hmm. they figured out that it was internal bleeding. Yeah. And they had no explanation for it. And the picture, the imaging. Oh, yeah, you can see it to the- MRI like, imaging, I think? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was MRI. I think it's MRI yeah. imaging, and they it's like a big bump. Yeah. A hematoma. You, bump. you could even see it with the naked eye, though. Oh, like, yeah, it was his, huge. His head was all lopsided. Yeah. And then, so... No idea why. Yeah, no idea why. That actually happens again on the show. Yeah. He has to get escorted back to the hospital. Has the same thing. It's just smaller this time because yeah. he kind of caught it quicker. And then there was another person who he was on a team that they had built this, this like a, you know, like a Chevrolet Tahoe or something that was decked out yeah. in all this gear that would help them see UAPs. It was your classic, like, crazy nerd yeah, it looked ghost like hunting a, van type thing. Yeah, right. But, but, like, more science -y Like than mystery that. machine. Yeah, but like, decked out. Science. I mean, tens of thousands of dollars of equipment. Like, if Velma had designed the mystery <laughs> machine instead of Shaggy. <laughs> Steep so, cut. So, and uh, so anyway, one one of the guys from this crew, they're all sitting just in the trailer discussing their plan of attack, their plan of experimentation. And he starts to have an uncontrollable tremor. Uncon and his head is pounding. It gets so bad that Travis Taylor is like, let's put him in this silo. Because he knew that no like wave radiation would be able to. It function like a Faraday cage. Yeah, Faraday cage. And so <laughs> they go into the silo, and all of a sudden it stops. He drinks like four bottles of water, and he's good to go. So weird. Very weird. And all, and I say all that to say that one of the things they discovered in the midst of digging in Thomas Winterton's head and, and this guy having his tremor is that whenever stuff would happen, whenever phenomena would occur. If they happened to be measuring radio frequencies, they would get a clear spike at the 1.6 gigahertz signal yeah. on the radio wave spectrum. And here's the thing, and, and this is going to come up throughout the episode, so I wanted to lay it out really clearly now. Here's the thing. Whenever this happened, there was no military installations close by. Mm -hmm. There was no air traffic that was trying to communicate with yep. them. There was no satellites. There was no none of their equipment was yeah. operating on that uh, on that frequency on that frequency. Yeah. And this is a frequency that's commonly used in GPS and radio communication. Yeah. And so, was there something trying to communicate with them? That's the idea. I'm just going to leave that there for now. Now, Ben, that that 1.6 gigahertz frequency continues to come up. And what was one of the most fascinating elements of the show, I think, in my opinion was the way that that frequency led them to this nexus seeming strange location and a bunch of phenomena that really sort of centered on this well triangled yeah on this T talk talk us through that the triangle yeah so that's a that is a really good point it is one of the more interesting aspects of the show and it i think it actually goes to show the scientific chops of dr taylor yeah like he figured out this thing that didn't fit and followed it to the end and so, i was annoyed i was like he kept going back to I kept it. being like, why does this matter? Like, I don't cares? think this way. Like, I'm not an engineer type. I'm not good at fixing stuff. And so I was bored. I'm like, 
I would have not kept going. Yeah, yeah. And he did. I mean, he figured it out. All, all credit. So anyway. Kind of. <laughs> so what he wants to do is is triangulate where the signal's coming from, mm-hmm. at least thereabouts. Yeah. And so the way that you do this is you measure the signal from three different locations, and then you're able to take that data and figure out where those three points come together. Mm-hmm. So you can find the uh, the general area of the source. So what they do is they they take that triangulated data and they find out that the source of the 1.6 gigahertz signal was popping up and and it was supposedly like 5,000 feet up in the air above an area of the ranch where kind of there's an intersection of dirt roads and it forms what looks like a triangle. Mm -hmm. If you have a bird's eye view, it looks like a triangle. So 5,000 feet in the air above this triangle road is the source of this signal. And they start to focus a lot of attention there. And they start to realize that the area above the triangle, that 5,000 foot mark, really acts like an anomalous area. Yeah. Almost like there's some barrier there that you can't see. So here's an example. One of the things they do is they fly a helicopter over the triangle area. Mm -hmm. And they go in, in the different elevations or different altitudes and different patterns to try and figure out if the instrumentation on the aircraft is going to do anything funky. Yeah. What they find is right in between that three to 5,000 foot area, the altimeter in the aircraft multiple times was showing for more than just a moment, like for a long time, that they were only 40 feet off the ground. So strange. And they knew, I mean, it doesn't take a genius to see when you're higher. You're in there with them. You're thousands of feet in the air. And it showed they were 40 feet off the ground. So... They were like, okay, this is weird, but maybe something's messing with the altimeter. Instruments malfunction, but right. is there something underneath us that's invisible? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, exactly. So the pilot is like, all right, well, we need to land because we can't have malfunctioning equipment. And right. altimeter is actually pretty very important. important. Okay, number one, <laughs> helicopters are not safe things. Number one, helicopters common aircraft L. I'm amazed that these guys did it. They're like, you know what? There's this crazy weird thing where this strange signal is coming from where magnetic anomalies that interfere with important instrumentation work. Let's fly Let's a sophisticated helicopter full of instruments. aircraft version of a cabana bed. Yeah, and, and go, fly up go through 5, it. 5,000 feet in the air. You're like, but but should you do but that? Why? Though? So anyway, and they do. They land after this weird thing and they're like, that was creepy. Well then our guy, Eric Bard, He's reviewing the footage, and he notices in just one frame, one frame of footage, a black streak like some object flew underneath the helicopter. And the camera only caught it for one frame. One frame. So it had to be going insanely fast. Because the frame rate on the camera, they're probably filming it either 24, 29, 30, or 60 frames per second. Right. Either way, it's like... Probably not 60, because the... It's probably not 60. The resolution wasn't amazing. That'd be like 4K. Yeah, that's probably 30 frames to be... Like, 29 or 30 frames to be average. Yeah, and the... I mean, the width of the frame had to be at least the length of the helicopter. Yep. Which is probably about 30 to 40 feet. Yep. So, you do the math. The thing is traveling fast. I just did the math. It was traveling real fast. Very fast. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you. I don't want to show off. And then one of the other things that they did, and I'll talk about this before we get into one of the more interesting stories, is that they took uh, um, the helicopter back up into the sky. Brave. Yeah, yeah. And they had these parachutes that they were going to drop, and the parachutes had all these data sensors attached to them. So they were going to do a bunch of these, and they were going to track the colors, and there was like different weights to see how things reacted, all all the sciencey stuff, whatever. Yeah. So that's the technical term. Right, the sciencey stuff. Mm hmm. So they go, actually, so they go above the 5,000 foot mark so they can toss the parachutes through the anomalous yep, area. with the trackers. And when they look at the trackers again, so they watched all this take place. Yeah. And there was some weird stuff where like, oh, it looks like it's getting blown by wind that's not there. It's and, really tough to like yeah. land things from 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 or 5,000 feet. But, anywhere near where you're trying to. Right. So stuff gets blown around and they're kind of like, maybe it's hitting the thing and bouncing off. And the viewers are like, all right, guys, like relax. But then they go and they look at the tracked GPS data. Because yeah. each one had a GPS tracker. And they found that dozens of these parachutes, dozens, showed their GPS going into the Mesa yeah. and then popping back out again. So weird. Like they knew where the Mesa was. Yeah. There's no secret. And the tracker on multiple of them was showing that it was going into the Mesa, flying around in there, and then popping back out lower, closer to the ground. And it reminds me 
It reminds me too, Ben. What does it remind you of? It reminds me of the sighting of the silvery disc that flew into the mesa and just disappeared into the rocks. Yes. I mean, multiple times they have these instrument, these instrumentation. Like, it's not the same thing, but it kind of rhymes. It's like they had instrumentation messed with, with the GPS. Because there's no way physically that they watched. It didn't happen. But the instruments said that it did. Mm. Okay. So either they missed it and something really weird happened and it literally like flew through the mesa as if the mesa didn't exist. Right. Dimensional shift of a plank length. Okay. Nice. I mean, nice. sure, maybe, <laughs> Pro- but probably not. Good use of the word plank length. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Ben. That was just for you. Yeah. That's you know, great. That was just for you, Ben. That's great. Or there's some sort of magnetic anomaly or anomaly that's messing with the GPS technology. Which seems to be the most likely thing is that it's some sort of failure of the technology. Yeah, sure. But either way, this it happens in this area. Yeah. Over and over it happens in this area. And even when it's even when they did things, to my memory at least, even when they ran experiments that seemed to fail, it turns out that they didn't actually fail. Do you remember the the one with the, the radio station? Oh yeah. So here's what they do. They get the one point six gigahertz, they get on that train. Yeah. And and Travis Taylor's like, I'm going to follow this gold vein and yeah, see where it goes. Figured out. So they figured out that it was sourced at the Triangle area, and they kept recording it, and it and it sounded like, you know, a crackly radio, mm-hmm. like someone, you know, you you, you could he, you could reach the point of being like someone's trying to communicate with you. Yeah, like encrypted radio signals sound like yeah. staticky stuff. Exactly. So it sounded that way, and so Taylor was like, well, what if we just went to the local radio station? and broadcast this recording of this signal yeah. that we're getting and just see what happens. So again, it's just this like shot in the dark idea. Such a weird idea. Let's just see what sticks. Yeah. So they go, him and Eric Bard go, they broadcast their recording for a few minutes over the they, airwaves. They get this, this lady at a, a local radio yeah. station. She's like in a shack in the yeah. middle of nowhere. She's like, all right, honey. She's like, fine, ahead. you'll come on. Yeah, you plug it in. Y'all the listeners back, won't man. care. You know? yeah, she's oh, probably Native like, American. And they're like, now we're going to play, you know, for some, uh, we're going to play the, the signal for the demons. Yeah. <laughs> that was a Toby Keith. We'll put a boot in your booty. And then it's the next, American way. Yeah. <laughs> Next thing they know, they're listening to... Dave Matthews Band is next. (laughs) After the weird alien thing. So they play the thing and nothing happens. Yeah. And so they're like, ah, okay, you know, whatever. Nothing weird. They kind of expected to see maybe a UAP in the sky. Yeah. And nothing weird. Whatever. So they go back to the ranch. And then the next day, one of the other members of the team, who I haven't mentioned yet, his name is Jim Morse. Mm -hmm. He's just another worker on the ranch. He comes up to Eric and, and Taylor and he's like, hey, guys didn't you all do that radio signal thing yesterday? They're like, yeah. And he goes, okay, you need to see this. He pulls out his phone, goes to social media. I don't know what social media it was, but it was probably Gab. It was like a local page, (laughs) probably the best social media there is, Gab. Uh, He goes to like the local group for Ballard, Utah. Yeah. And he pulls up this video and multiple people had taken similar videos of the Mm -hmm. night before. There's like a dozen or so strange lights in the sky yeah it's pitch black at night there's all these uaps lighting up and then you know disappearing and lighting up again and disappearing and the, and it seems like they're flying in a formation almost doing like a sweep of ballard like they're like they're looking for something is what I, it i mean that's just what it looks like you know okay again my theory which i know i'm like jumping all the guns it's almost like they were looking for the signal it's like okay my theory is that the demons are imitating technological advanced civilizations yeah in an attempt to fool people who are fooled by an evolutionary biological worldview you know this yep. materialist worldview yep. this is exactly what you'd expect all right i have something that'll back that up let's hear it however it's really stupid I, well that's even better but it's a principle and i want you to bear with mm-hmm. me so mm-hmm. you said earlier that these things aren't the same but they rhyme like yeah, yeah. the things between the Sherman area uh, era, the Nids era, and now the Fugal era, yeah. they aren't the same, but they rhyme. It reminds me, and this is where the stupidity comes in, of this George Lucas quote. Okay. <laughs> where he was talking about Star Wars, the original mm-hmm. trilogy, yeah. and then the prequel trilogy. And he said that the stories rhymed. Yeah. And it's like typological. Mm-hmm. And it makes me think that maybe they're not as smart as we're giving them credit for. Because if you go back to the Sherman era, they're mimicking a high, highly advanced technology, but in a way that would be like contemporary technology today. Yeah. 
And then today they're mimicking what we would think is high advanced technology, but who knows, maybe in 10 years, it actually doesn't seem that advanced anymore. Yeah. And so it's almost like they're just ahead. Mm. And that's why you get this rhyme scheme. Interesting. Where like it, it, they're trying to do the same thing. The only reason it looks different is because our own technology has evolved. Mm. So they have to shift it a little bit. They to just stay the ahead of the curve. Mm. I don't know. That that's that is that is something to chew on. Maybe it's totally dumb. Brian and I are pretty blessed guys. I mean, we get to make this podcast together for all of you, and because of that, we get introduced to a lot of really amazing other podcasts. One of those that we've come to know and love is the 10-minute Bible Hour podcast. That's right, Ben. The 10-minute Bible Hour podcast is hosted by our friend Matt Whitman. In this project he's got going, it really is awesome. His his passion for God's word has driven him to release an episode every weekday morning. That's insane. You heard us right. <laughs> every insane. weekday morning. Where he goes through whole books of the Bible in single episode summaries or multiple episode series. And he breaks the Bible down quickly and concisely, keeping the episodes short. I mean, it is called the 10-minute Bible hour mm-hmm. and very easy to digest. The 10-Minute Bible Hour podcast is a great way to make fun, deep-dive Bible study a part of your daily rhythm. And you can find the 10-Minute Bible Hour podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you prefer to get your shows. Or better yet, go to www.vtmbh.com. That's vtmbh.com, and there's a link in the description for that, by the way, to find all of the 10-Minute Bible Hour podcast episodes. While you're there... Tell Matt that we said hello. Cheers. Let's move on. (laughs) Perfect segue. (laughs) So when they found the triangle area, they found the anomaly in the sky. Travis Taylor decided what he was going to do was start poking the hornet's nest is what he called it. Yep. By shooting rocket after rocket after rocket up into the sky in that area. And they realized that when they did this, there was a much higher odds of stuff happening. And they, mm-hmm. like the NIDS team, also caught on to the idea that the cows could act as biosensors. Yep. So at every launch, some members of the team would be looking up in the sky and other members would be looking at the cattle in the field. Yep. And if anyone saw anything, they had to shout. So during one launch, the rocket goes up and they quickly realize that the cows are acting strange. So strange, in fact, that they start stampeding away from the launch site. Yep. And they have never done this before. This is totally new. It's exactly like what happened back in the day. With right. Sherman. Exactly. So they stampede away. And so Dr. Taylor is like, okay, look up in the sky. And mm-hmm. sure enough, they see, and it's caught on camera. Yeah. On the History Channel. Yeah. A UAP appear in the sky, and it's the middle of the day. Yeah. It's still weird. visible, and it stays there for like 30 seconds. They film, I mean, they film it clearly. They film it. About 10 people witnessed it for a long time, and then it disappeared mm-hmm. as the rocket parachuted back to the ground. Yep. It's so weird. And this event actually took place just a few days before the dead cow incident that we talked about yes. in the cold open. So all this stuff has to be connected. I love Dr. Taylor, too, the whole time. Me, too. He's, he's like, like, look, look, it's up in the air. Everybody up there. I mean, he's just like. Eyes in the sky. Eyes he in the is, sky. He is amped. He is so amped. And, he, and he's, it's it's perfect because he's like the, the greatest combination of Southern nerd. Yeah. But he's truly fascinated by this stuff. Like, you can tell it's an earnest, serious interest for him. Right. But th- just the fact that there's so many witnesses, so many things. I look at this sighting, and I'm like, well, when I first started watching the show, I thought this is going to be another every episode ends with a cliffhanger that turns out to be nothing kind of thing. Right. You know where they're like, my dad always laughs about the Oak Island show Uh that History Channel has because he watches it. They have him hooked and he knows it. He's like, (laughs) they have me hooked. Every episode ends with, could it be the Knights Templar? Yeah. And then the the next episode's like, it wasn't. And then they they just keep going. Is this the Holy Grail? I fully expected that to be the Skinwalker show because I was familiar with the whole Skinwalker story, the Sherman era, the Nids. All of that already. And you know the pattern. They always, do, every single yeah. one of these shows do it. But it's like, man, they got this one and, and they're like, oh, this one's legit. They legitimately got so many weird things that were actually documented. They did this one thing, dude. They did this one thing where at the beginning of the show, like season one and two, mm-hmm. they were much more interested in trying to dig a lot yeah. and then get the ranch to like react against them. Mm-hmm. 
And a lot of it was focused around Homestead 2. Yeah. Which you, if you remember from NIDS, Homestead 2 was where they saw that big, bright blue orb yep. that was like trying to hide from them. Yep. So this is an area of, of high focus for every investigative team. And before they really honed in on the triangle area, they were spending a lot of time at Homestead 2. Homestead 2, also where the investigators earlier heard like the foreign languages over their head. Yes. Laughing at them. Tons of stuff happened at Homestead 2. Yes. So they are doing a night study of Homestead 2. They got their thermal cameras out. They got night vision out. And nothing's really happening. And mm-hmm. then all of a sudden, and it is completely random. Yeah. The cows are still acting fine. Mm-hmm. They don't see anything in the sky. But some one one of the team members, I can't remember who, is watching the thermal camera. And in the middle of Homestead 2, in the middle of the doorway, this black, cold void appears. Yeah. And, it, I mean, it, out of nowhere, where mm-hmm. the temperature drops by, like, tens of degrees. Yeah. Completely randomly. And then the black void, you can see it on the camera. It's like a black hole because mm-hmm. it's so cold. It grows and grows and grows and grows. And then stays this big for some amount of time. People start feeling really weird. Yeah. They start measuring strange magnetic field anomalies. Yeah. They start measuring gamma radiation. And then after a few minutes, it just closes back up and it goes back to normal temperatures. And it makes you think of the portals. It does make you think of the portals, Ben. And this goes back to what I'm saying. Like, the portal is still there. It's just that for whatever reason, now they don't feel the need to make it visible in the light spectrum because now we have better thermal imaging. Yeah, or it's just, I mean, one thing that happens when you read the, the basically the summaries of the study of any area that was studied over a long period of time, it, it can give you the sense that every five minutes something crazy is happening. Yeah, this is multiple well, years. No, it's like even the Sherman area, it, it got intense. Uh, even something as intense as the Mothman flap, the 13 months. Yeah. Th- there's still most of the time nothing's happening. Yeah. And most of the time you're not documenting everything that is happening. So I wonder if they will eventually get some kind of portal activity that is visible. Maybe. Well, they did have one orb situation. Do you remember when the the cameras, they had like thermal cameras set up surveilling Homestead 2? Yep. And one night, it was after they had seen a UAP, uh, and it was actually one of the most prominent UAPs they saw. They launched a rocket up. Yep. The cow started acting funny. So, you know, Travis Taylor's like, everyone look up. And they see this donut-shaped UFO. I'm yeah. going to call it a UFO yeah. because it was flying like a ship, but it didn't have any of the navigation lights of a plane. Mm-hmm. And they uh, and there were no satellites above them. Yeah. And it starts like going north across the sky, and then it just disappears as if it dissolves into the night, which is <gasps> that in itself is really weird. So weird. And then later, Eric Bard calls Doctor Taylor into his office in the middle of the night. Yeah. Eric had been up reviewing footage. And he's like, you, you got to lay eyes on this. Yeah. They see floating about 15 feet off the road in front mm-hmm. of Homestead 2, this probably a, a soccer ball size or a basketball sized light orb. Yeah. Just kind of meandering along. Very weird motion. And it's leaving this like trail almost. Yeah. Where that- it's distorting the image behind mm-hmm. it. And it completely stumps the guys. Yeah. Because it, it looked like sometimes you get dust orbs in cameras that... Uh-huh are close to the lens of the camera, and so they fuzz out. You know what I'm saying? Where it's focusing far away. Yeah. And just like the human eye, if you hold your finger right in front of your eye and focus on something 10 feet away, it'll look fuzzy and huge. Right. So sometimes dust particles do that. But what was strange about this one is that because of the trees, you can see because of the parallax going in and out of the trees, that this is genuinely far away from the camera. Yeah. It's not dust pareidolia right in front. It's not. It's far enough away that... It was at least like 20, 25 yards away. And I'm not an orb on camera. Like, imp- I'm not impressed by that, to be honest, guys. <laughs> like, at our church. Yeah, Brian and I okay. have an ongoing feud. We have, this. like, a security system here. Not going to give you a lot of details about it, but it's infrared, and it's got, so it can, does night vision and whatever. Okay, so there's, like, this one spot on the stairway. Yeah, it's a creepy where stairway. Where certain members of the staff. Me and Dan. Are convinced, who will remain nameless. Me and Dan are convinced <laughs> that there is some sort of orby thing happening. I've seen the thing. Um, it's it dust. literally happens at the same time. No, it it's predictable. No. no, the path is unpredictable. It goes up <laughs> and down. Future episode. It's like, dude, anyway, the, okay. the orb of, of refuge church. And it's like a 10 second episode. I think that's the whole story. I think it's an angel. 
See, this is what I have to deal <laughs> with. Guys. This is what I'm dealing with, guys. No, I. But in all seriousness, I'm genu- generally not that impressed by orbs on camera, or because digital photography is artifacts. You yeah, see, even sure. film. I mean, there's all sorts of things that can happen mechanically. Bugs crawling on the lens. The security cameras look really freaky. But this one. But this one, I, I will say, is difficult to explain. Yeah. And it's also an, so there's the parallax with the with the different tree branches where it's yeah. clearly in front of someone behind others. Yeah. But then there's also like the boundary of the sphere mm-hmm. is really clear. Yeah, it's very clear. It's not like it's a fuzzy boundary. But you know what? I think it's the ghost of JFK. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, he would he would no, obviously he'd be haunting the Pentagon for sure. Well, that's for obvious for reasons. This, I mean, for obvious reasons. <laughs> Don't unalive us, CIA. Yeah, please. That was a joke. 100. This is all satire. This is all anyway. Satire. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so th- there was that orb situation that happened yeah. there. There was the infrared uh, cold spot that they saw. There was a lot of other activity, just like NIDS, where they would have personal experiences. Right. Feeling really intense fear or emotions. Um, but th- they had medical events with migraines and weird... Yeah. Th- I mean, a lot of stuff like that where the people were functioning almost as biosensors, but then not quite documentable. Yeah. So along with the normal NID stuff of experiencing many things, they actually did, though, man. They captured so much. They did capture a lot. And one of the things that they had in common with NIDs was this proclivity for equipment to malfunction yeah. right when you needed it most. And, and, and people that were contractors brought onto the ranch who do this full-time with their yeah. equipment. Decades of experience. Like the drone guy. For example. Oh my gosh, yeah. So this guy comes on the ranch. I forgot him. He's going to do some mapping and aerial footage and stuff like that with a drone. It's a very expensive, like $30,000 drone. I'm not talking about GoPro Hero, Lurk, or whatever it's called, the The, Maverick, Maverick Maverick Pro. It's not a Maverick Pro Pro 4K. It's it's huge. It's like probably two to four feet across. And it can do LIDAR. Like it can map the the geography of the area. It's really high level stuff. So it, which LIDAR reminds me about how we have to do an Expedition Bigfoot thing. Anyway. That show is okay. All right, Expedition Bigfoot, guys. You, you guys, watch it. you guys. Okay, but the lidar drone comes on thirty thousand dollar drone, fully charged. Like the guy does this routinely, gets hired to go do for geological surveys mainly, not ghost hunting. Like he's not a, a doing weird stuff. No, yeah, he's doing this for like oil survey, like big, big. <laughs> do- I mean, when you pay this guy's probably yeah. thousands and thousands of dollars to have him come, laying foundations for commercial projects. Stuff shows like up, that drone won't work. I can't remember exactly what it was. Like, here's the thing. It was fully charged. Yeah. And it was working uh, when they were at the command center. At, yeah. Like the, the, you know, where Eric Bard's office yeah, is. Yeah, and basically. there's a helipad. And it's, like- yeah, it's where everybody gets together on the ranch. And then they go over to Homestead 2 where they're going to launch the thing. And all of a sudden it won't connect. The, the battery is plummeting in power. Yes. And if he goes back to the command center, it like starts working again. The problem though is that now the battery is drained. Yeah. So he can't actually do anything because the battery is supposed to last for like a ton of time. Yeah, like a full time. day yeah. or something of up and down. And now he's like, well, I, I can't risk it falling out of the sky. Like the battery is almost gone. Yeah. And it there's no explanation. Stuff like that. The, Stuff like that. The best one though. Yeah, what's the best one, Ben? Is when the people came down from the Salt Lake astronomy society this is the craziest okay so this is like near the finale of season three yeah and they've honed in on the triangle area they've honed in on the anomaly that's about five thousand feet up in the air yeah and brian tell us about the crazy night of unfortunate events that occur when these guys point the telescopes in the sky it is absolutely crazy so these guys are bringing in a range of telescopes from like Really high-end amateur hobby telescopes, some of them, all the way through, I mean, like, astronomical society grade. These guys' three telescopes was like, these were some of the nicest you can get. Very, very expensive telescopes that had computers in them that would help to map the sky, tell you where you were. You could tell it where to go, and it would know where it is in the sky. But the way that they worked is that they would map onto a known location in the sky to begin yeah. with so that the telescope could orient itself. Yeah, and calibrate. Say, this is where I am. Okay, I, I know where I am. Yeah. Good. And with the date and the time and that information, then it could you could say, now point at Orion's belt and right. go over there. And point like at lock, Sirius. And lock onto it and track it. Omicron per CI8. Go show me that. <laughs> Perfect. Like, And it would instantly lock on. And, and the idea of the experiment, just so you know, was that they were pointing the telescopes up through the triangle anomaly area at the stars in the sky behind it 
so that they could see if there was any disturbance in the light. Yeah, like any lensing or refraction, yeah. anything like that. Because they know with a high degree of precision, astronomical, you know, photography and this is the high degree of precision. They know exactly what should be happening. Right. This is actually the way that astronomical discoveries are often made. Mm -hmm. Is by yeah. seeing light do stuff it shouldn't do. Right. And then you go, oh, there's a big black hole there. Yeah, that's there's bending something light. there that's making yeah. the light bend. Yeah. So so they're they're taking again. Travis Taylor is an astrophysicist, right? So he's right, an astrophysicist. Yeah, he's an astrophysicist. So he's like, all right, this is my wheelhouse. This Let's is try to do world. this. One of the three members who had never heard of the ranch before, didn't have any prior spooky knowledge, anything like this. He's just like, I'm showing up to help with this television show. Probably super stoked to show off his knowledge on TV, like the yeah. nerd who collects train sets. <laughs> and uh, the, the, finally, a show is like, we need a guy that knows everything about model trains from the 1940s. For like a really attractive girl's <laughs> like, tell me about trains. And he's like, I have been training for this <laughs> for my entire Born life. Born for this. Yes. Okay. So he's super stoked, shows up, puts his telescope in. It's got a database of known constellations, stars, and planets that it can lock onto. Sun setting. It's getting finally dark enough. They've been waiting and setting up for hours. Experiment can begin. And uh, Travis Taylor, he figured that he was going to try to provoke some sort of activity, not just look at it statically, but also provoke some activity with rockets. And I, I'll provide another layer of detail there, too. Yeah, yeah we'll come back to the rocket element. So he's going to shoot rockets up. But th what they had also done was they got three insanely high-powered lasers, yeah. like super lasers, and they set them up so that they all point up and then converge at the 5,000 5, foot feet. mark. So Travis is like, I want to I want to really bother the anomaly. That yeah, was he, his idea. They're like poking the hornet's nest times of everything they've got. In so the the, yeah. Exa so these telescopes are pointing like at the convergence of these through lasers. That. They want to shoot the rocket right through it and then they just want to look at the sky. Film all of it. You can film happens. through the lenses of these yeah. telescopes as well. Sorry to interrupt. So, no, you're good. That's that's good info. So they're, they're setting up the thing and all of a sudden... The astronomer's like, hang on, pause, guys. Like, pause the TV show. Like, don't shoot the rockets or anything. I can't get my cal my telescope to calibrate. Right. My my telescope, the computer, is failing to recognize the position we're in on the Earth based on what the sky looks like. He's had this telescope. He's been using this tool for over ten years, trying to manually lock onto the object. You know, trying to trying to figure this out. And all of a sudden, he figures out what's happening. Is in his words. Something is getting into his computer on the telescope and deleting stars. Yes. <laughs> so what he said was he was looking at the convergence of these lasers, at the anomaly area. Yeah. And everything within that perimeter was getting deleted off his computer. It's all known stars. It's like, all known. It, it was all be in there. He, he had, he was watching them get deleted. Yeah, and they're like, oh, that's gone. It's that's gone, 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 gone. And he's like, what? This is just a useless pile of junk now. And, and so he, none of this had ever happened before. It, ever. Nothing like it. So something was hacking in that, just like the telephone, just like the iPhone, I call exactly. it a telephone. <laughs> just like the sonogram. Just the, like the sonogram. The, that's a yeah, yeah. medical thing. Dial me up, because, you know, you have to go, <laughs> wind me up. He, 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 this never happened. Somebody's hacking into his computer or something. I mean, what some, some and I know you guys are like, look, it's a software glitch. Like a software yeah. does it. He'd been using it for 10 years. It never was, has anything oh, happen. Shows up to Skinwalker Ranch. It does the most routine of functions. It's like the, this isn't even advanced stuff for this telescope. No, no. This is the, this is the, so you can start. Right. Stuff. This is the setup. And it just starts deleting the stars. What has the power to delete stars out of the sky? That's my question. Whoa, that's a big question. <laughs> okay, that's not actually I'm what kidding. happened. Yeah, no, to, to be clear, <laughs> the, the stars, stars were still weren't there. deleted. <laughs> but it, all this kept happening, and it was problem after problem. Constellation and galaxy and star, one after another, was deleted from this guy's database. Finally, he commented, and I'm quoting, quote, It doesn't want me to look at the anomaly. Yeah, it's like, nah. It? Whatever it, it is doesn't want him to look there and he was able to manually lock on to things that were just around the perimeter of that so anomalous weird. area but whenever he would go inside it was like nope nothing there nothing is there so all of his tech was <laughs> useless now but our good friend our hero our hero dr travis taylor yes he got excited about this of thomas winterton and i thomas winterton and i he's the eye he's the <laughs> <laughs> he was like you know what we got to shoot off rockets right now 
because something's yeah. going down. Yeah. He had the He's like a kid mind. in a candy store with he the is, rockets. Man. He's like, these are my rockets. I'm a rocketeer. He's he's like an expert in this. I he's am. Like, we got to shoot some rockets right now. <laughs> I am a rocket. That's what he, he's so, literally a rocket. He's like, something's going on. It's time to poke. We want to poke the bear right now and see what happens. Wouldn't you know it, though, that right before the rocket launched, they're in the countdown. Like, they're at five, okay? Two of the three telescopes lost their connections to their cameras. Making any... So, here's the it thing. Let, them. Let's differentiate here. So, they couldn't automatically lock onto objects because they were getting deleted from their database. That's one thing. But they could still see on their computers what the telescope was looking yeah. at. Yeah. So, they could manually move it and point to the thing yeah. and say, all right, this is going to have to do. Let's keep her steady, right? But now, the computer screen, the camera screen was black. They couldn't... So, they could still look through the aperture yeah. and see stuff, but there was no recording available guys this is like a usb connection okay <laughs> so crazy. this this isn't like this isn't even bluetooth this is no. literally like you plug it in boom this shouldn't happen no and so the guy who had never heard of the ranch before the guy who he was operating the biggest telescope and his reaction when you see it is just so genuine he yeah. sincerely doesn't understand how any of this is possible they're like welcome to the ranch right and so it was, it was then that principal researcher Eric Bard, our, our guy Eric, for the first time in his multi-year career on the ranch, he's been here since 2016. Yeah. He lost any access to any of the surveillance cameras on the ranch all at once. <laughs> what does that remind you of, though? NIDS? It reminds me of NIDS. And the other thing is... Cold open and NIDS? These are multiple independent systems. These aren't yeah, connected. They like, aren't it wasn't connected. as if they were all plugged into the same power outlet. They've right. got ba- you know, cameras on batteries. We've got lots of things, multiple points of failure. Some of them are all using hotspots. Some of them are using, like, routers. Some yeah. of them are using Ethernet cables. It was like when they brought that big investigative van on that we talked about earlier. Exactly. And it just yeah. all stopped working. It, I think it was called Osiris. And yeah. it all, like, four times in a row. Right when they were about to do something, it would shut off. It would shut off. They would reboot. Mm -hmm. You'd be like, okay, ready to go. For multiple minutes, everything would be great. And then at like three, two, Mm -hmm. it would shut off again. And then one. We're firing in five, four, three, shut off. But here's what that tells me. What does it tell you about? Is that they're getting close. And it speaks English. (laughs) Well, it does, obviously. Uh, They know all the. Twa. Okay, anyway. But it's it's like they want them to waste rockets because they're getting close to something. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I'm right that like I'm right there with you, Ben. <laughs> so all this is happening. By the way, Eric noticed that while all this is going on, telescope camera shutting down, the 1.6 gigahertz signal is being oh. is being played like hardcore. Of course, it's okay. like spy. And when you see the uh, the waveform yeah. that they show, like the little graph, it's like everything's functioning down here. There's like a little baseline that's always going. Yeah, and then Background at 1.6 noise. gigahertz, it's like. 10x freaking Mount Everest, just like a perfect pinpoint spike. Yes, Whoop. and there it is, and it would go away and come back. Yeah. So they here here's their plan. Here's their plan. This is Dr. Taylor's plan. He's gonna take a separate laser beam, like yeah. a high powered laser pointer, and he's gonna get his guy to point it up in the sky so that the telescopes have something really visible, high contrast that they can lock on, and they're just gonna hope, literally wing in a prayer, hope that the cameras turn back on. And so that if they do, they'll be ready. So this guy's shining the laser. All this is happening in the same night, people. This guy's shining the laser beam up into the air. And he's like, uh, hey, Travis, y- uh, you're going to want to come look at this. Travis goes over there and looks. And when it reaches a certain point in the sky, the laser beam starts to bend. Come on. And you can see it on camera. Bent laser beams don't bend? I know. Unless there's a gravitational anomaly. That's a pretty strong rotation. You're telling me. Are you kidding me? And then it also like split and forked into two different beams at the end. And, yeah, then and it would, would like, come back together. It would do it like as he moved through this. Yeah. It would like phase in and out. <sighs> you guys. So weird. So on top of all this, I know this is a lot happening. In addition to all this, Thomas Winterton starts seeing that the cows are acting strange. This is the last straw. So you know how last time the cows were running away. Yeah. So this time, they were all, like, crowding around the area. (laughs) Like, there was a fence around these guys, and it was just cows lining the entire (laughs) fence. Like, they were super, 
curious as to what was going on. And it's weird. It's weird. Like cows don't behave that way. They're mm-hmm. normally just happy to mind their own business. And you got Thomas Winterton, who knows all about him, looking yeah, at him going, this like, is weird. He's a he's a cow guy. Yeah, he's and a- he's like, this is not right. Yeah. This is messed up. So our guy, Travis Taylor, he's like, okay, let's look up into the sky. And they all look up, all of them, the telescope mm-hmm. guys, the camera crew, the entire research yep. team, they all see as bright as Venus a ma- and it's not Venus, by the way. It's not Venus. But, but they see a massive ball of light mm-hmm. slowly drifting across the sky. It looks like a planet, but it's not a planet mm-hmm. because it's 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 spherical. There's no blinking lights, but it almost moved like organically, like an amoeba crawling across the sky. That's yeah. what it seemed yeah. like. And then it flew steadily east before abruptly, like in a 90 degree turn, started going north, mm-hmm. moving a little bit quicker. One of the astronomers who was operating a telescope who saw it said, quote, it didn't have a deliberate direction like an aircraft and there was no blinking lights. It was, it was lazy, taking its time. It was far too big to be any aircraft. And they also have the aircraft data at all times. Right. They monitor part of what Eric they monitors monitor air traffic. is air traffic over the ranch because everything that goes in the sky has to have an, F, you know, uh, what is FAA beeper that sends out right. this is what i am i'm a 747 going this is my direction so you know even small planes they they would yep. know yep nope nothing nothing slowly the object faded away whatever it was and right when it did the telescope started working again the databases were restored the camera connection was restored and they knew that the night was over nothing more was going to happen yep except later that night Eric would record what appeared to be a massive explosion of light from out of nowhere in the sky. And when you look at the footage, it almost looks like a door being opened in a dark room that's backlit and then light coming through and then the door shut again really fast. What did I say? It seems like a portal. What did I say? I said they're going to catch a portal then. They did. And then you know what? By the end of this outline that I did not totally read ahead, trust me, (laughs) they filmed a portal. I, I mean... Come on. It was, it's insane. It's yeah. insane. Come on. So, Brian, as we close out this episode in yeah. this series, let's give our closing thoughts and comments. Yeah. What I'll, do you think is going on? I'll keep it really simple and say that there's kind of two, there's two levels for me. One is there's this theme that this is land that was pre-Christian and never actually Christian. We have native peoples, mm-hmm. animalistic, animist religion, things like that, native religion, and then we have uh, otherwise known as demons. Right. Of right. Co- and, right. <laughs> of course. I repeat myself. Then we have um, Mormonism come in. Yes. Mormonism is another one of these. Um, Mormonism actually shares much more in common with like Greek polytheism than it does with Christianity. Even though that sounds crazy. It's um, it's a polytheistic or a henotheistic religion where they believe in multiple gods but only worship one. Yes. Believe you can become a god. It's very much like created gods. They're much more akin to Greek deities right. than they are to the one true living God of Scripture, who's there's no other. There was none before him, none after Isaiah 40, Isaiah 44. I mean, go read it. The Psalms Project is a band putting all 150 psalms to music in their entirety using a combination of folk, rock, alternative pop, and orchestral arrangements to faithfully and artfully present the entire story of every psalm with music without gutting or censoring the God-breathed text. Over 80 musicians have contributed thus far, including Grammy nominees Phil Kagey and Jeff Dio. Here's a quick sample to get an idea of their sound. So make your ways, oh Lord, teach me your past. The Lord of hosts is with us. Go to thepsalmsproject.com slash haunted cosmos to get either a free CD, two complete album downloads for just $2, or to stream on your preferred platform. Again, that's thepsalmsproject.com slash haunted cosmos. Check it out today. So we have this land that is overrun with pagan and uh, and then cultic false religion. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's a big theme to me. And we see a lot of the things that these sort of religious ideologies are interested in all of a sudden show up. 
One of them is animistic issues like skinwalker stuff, Bigfoot sightings, things like that. The the wolf, all of these. That screams Native American lore to me, which is also deeply wrapped up with the Mormon story. Yes. Which is, which is that the Native Americans are a lost tribe of Israel. All this right. Thing. It's not true, but it's that's their story. Okay, then you have this other element that ties directly with to me with Mormonism. Because Mormonism is also like an extraterrestrial. They believe that that there's like a planet where God is from, Kolob. Yeah, it's like a plurality of worlds. Yeah. And you can, like, even the science fiction of a, an author like Brandon uh, Sanderson. Mm-hmm. I think Brandon Sanderson? Yeah, Brandon Sanderson. He wrote The Way of Kings, uh, the Mistborn series, sci-fi writer. A great writer, honestly. A teacher at BYU, professor on writing. Millions and millions of books sold, I think, at this point. Yeah. His worlds are very much Mormon because he's Mormon. And his sci-fi basically world builds in a Mormon way where there are planets with gods in different worlds, things like that, uh, as opposed to something more like Tolkien or Lewis when they wrote, it was from a more medieval and Christian Mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's one element here where you have the Mormon and native stuff. the, the, The entities are showing what they want to see. Yes. Okay, they're showing what they want to see. And the other element is what I've been saying the whole time, in my opinion, is that increasingly in North America... We have been seeing and we will continue to see an explosion of demonic counterfeits that are imitating technological advancement to support a materialist and highly advanced, you know, extraterrestrial story. Yeah. And we're going to get, I want to give all this away. We're going to talk more about this in a future episode. But to me, it's, it's that story of the, the West apostatizing. Mm-hmm. And, or in this case, a pre-Christian. Utah's still pre-Christian in my view. Yes. And the gods still attempt to reign. Yes. That, yeah. That's what I'm seeing. Yeah, I, I, I see Utah as one of the dark corners of Christ's world where the strong man's goods, there's still a lot of them to be plundered mm-hmm. uh, because it's a very dark place. So I like that you have a really holistic perspective. It's a broad perspective. I'll try and come up with what I think is a more uh, like short-term view or, or a more yeah. like localized, small scope yeah. perspective. What do I think is happening at the ranch? I do think it's demonic. Mm-hmm. I do think it's demonic. And for many of the same reasons that you brought up, it's mm-hmm. a pre-Christian place. Not only is it pre-Christian though, the religions that have been practiced in this place and that still are, are grossly pagan. Mm -hmm. It's not just atheism. It's not just this like foolish denial of God uh, that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. It's this brazen high-handed rebellion against the order that God has placed into the world. So they're not just ignoring Psalm 19. They're also ignoring passages like Leviticus 18 that says the Lord is casting the Canaanites out or the land is casting out the the Canaanites, vomiting them up because of all of these sins that they've committed, chief among them was failing to properly worship the living God. Yeah. So I think that that's very true. However, for stuff that I'm about to get into, uh, focused on the Mesa as a geographical entity, I almost think, and you know, this is very speculative, very speculative, but I almost see this place, this Mesa specifically, as a sort of nexus Um, like a geographical location where supernatural, especially demonic entities have much more access or something. Mm -hmm. Like it seems like either it's talismanic where they've latched onto it for the lore. And so they're just, they're taking that and they're running with it. It's a thin place. Yeah, it's a thin place. Perfect. Much like Bethel, like Jacob's Ladder type situations where he goes to Bethel and it's this thin place where there's, the presence of God is there. It's literally the the you know the gate of heaven, and then you have the Tower of Babel, which is almost this uh, pagan twist on the same thing. Mm-hmm. In fact, in fact, the stories of Jacob's Ladder versus Tower of Babel are typological. They're typologically identical. It's just one is the positive of the other. Interesting. Um, and so you have in the Tower of Babel potentially this place where they didn't choose it at random. But they call it the Tower of Babel, the gateway of heaven. Yeah, it's the gate of heaven. Because stuff was actually happening there. Mm-hmm. And so they build there because they have eyes in their head and they notice. Like mm-hmm. humans don't do things randomly. Mm-hmm. And so I think that maybe speculation could be said 
that this is a sort of thin place, a nexus place, where for whatever reason, maybe it's just the, the sheer amount of pagan practices that have occurred. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's just the providence of God uh, that, that we can't see into. That This place is almost a nexus that allows, not allows, but gives the demonic entities the ability to have more freedom almost, or, mm-hmm. or where they're able to express more, or where they're, they're able to try and start their attempt at decepting and thwarting the plans, de- deceiving and, th- and thwarting the plans of God. And of course, we know that that'll all come to ruin for them, and it'll come to nothing. But until it does, like, this is a place under judgment. I mean, y- of course Utah is under the judgment of God. Hmm. It's a horribly sinful and pagan place. We have the blood of children in the streets with Planned Parenthood, and then we also have a, a, a very high-handed rebellion against the proper worship of the living God, a denial of his existence, and then a active worship of his enemies. Yeah. So that's that for me. <laughs> ben, that was that was breathtaking. Eric, it was truly magnificent. I almost just called you Eric. Brian, I, I would take it. Brian, you are breathtaking. I'm <laughs> <laughs> So thank you, King. Here's what we're going to do. Yeah. As we close tonight— what I want to do is kind of go back to the beginning. Th- this place, if nothing else, is forcing us to go back to true science, which mm-hmm. is we make observations that we don't understand, and we try to reckon with what we're seeing in nature. And what I do like about this place mm-hmm. is it's forcing even the atheistic scientists to realize, maybe against their will, that there's no such thing as neutrality in the world. There are things that we can't explain. There are things that we don't understand in the slightest. And it all goes back to me for the Mesa. Mm -hmm. Skinwalker Ridge, this place where it all started, the curse of the Skinwalker, the traditional path of the Skinwalker. The NIDS team saw those massive dog traps in the caves. Mm -hmm. This team, the the Fugal team, threw smoke bombs into the Mesa at one point and the smoke didn't come back out. They found negative pressure pulling air in. It pulls air in. It's almost as if there is a void Mm -hmm. and there's a, a huge chamber under the Mesa. The parachute trackers went into the mesa and then came back out again. Maybe underneath this mesa is a horror of demonic origin. Maybe it's all, maybe it's nothing at all. Maybe mm. I'm completely wrong. We don't know. And that's fine. We don't know. Mm. Maybe it's a particularly great glory of God hid under a particularly large rock. We don't know that. <laughs> you either. never know. You never know. But as all good stories do, this one finds its current conclusion back at the beginning, at the mesa. Well, as part of the Fugal Era study... They've taken great interest in what the local Navajo tribesmen have to say about all this stuff. In fact, they brought in one of the tribe elders at one point because they had discovered something perplexing. On top of the mesa, underneath the highly problematic triangle area, the ranch hands stumbled upon what appeared to be an ancient megalithic rock formation. Now, all this is sandstone, so the erosion is pretty heavy, but it it seems too ordered to be natural, especially over such a large area. The area in question is a massive circular rock formation with a central mound of stones that include on them a number of engravings and what look to be even ancient tooling marks like drilled holes. Now, I'm going to resist the temptation to do what I really want to do, which is go into a massive rant about megalithic structures and circles and spirals. I mean, that's for another time. But that's for another time. That's for another time. Go back to Lee Tapley. Yes, season two, season two, season two. The point is... The Navajo elder guy said that this formation is almost certainly a place that was set up by the ancient dwellers long ago as a sort of uh, gateway to ward off the evil spirits of the netherworld. So they thought that this was, to, to use your phrase, a thin place. In other words, the Navajo elder thought that this looked just like the kind of thing his ancestors would have built and used to protect their own world from what they were sure was a portal to an evil and other dimension. Now, make of that what you will, okay? That doesn't mean that they're right. It just means that they believed that was what was causing all this nefarious stuff to take place. Coupled with that old use of these type of structures, there's also strong evidence that the formation was used for astrological purposes, tracking the planetary and stellar movements for some form of worship or protection. Look, the less religious among the team certainly don't give this type of specificity much weight. The whole team recognized that this when considered in conjunction with everything else that happened in the area, must mean, though, that the Mesa is somehow important. They at least granted it that. The Mesa was important. It was a big player in this haunting game. And so they called in backup. They got a ditch digger to come to the property so the team could send a drill right into the heart of this hill. What they found was, at the very least, confusing. 
the drill began to hit a hard layer of what was presumed to be just hard earth. And that layer pushed the drill down so that it couldn't come back up. It was propelling it deeper and deeper into the ground vertically. And then eventually it broke through and the drill was allowed to start going back up, but in such a way that it kept knocking into that hard layer above it. The drill operator described the phenomena as if the drill had gotten pushed underneath a dome and was now riding back up the inside surface of that dome. Now, this is strange enough in itself, but it doesn't stop there. You you see, the way these drills work is that inside of them, there's a hollow tube, so that as they drill, they're sending out through the tube the dirt that they're removing so that the operators can examine the minerals. Well, as they're hitting this hard layer, they notice first that no dirt is coming out anymore. The drill isn't actually drilling through any medium besides air, and yet it continues to push forward. Eventually, though, they notice some small flakes of stuff trickle out of the pipe. Only, it's not hard dirt. It's actually a really thin, very brittle metal. As with many revelations this team offers us, they can't give much of an answer as to why this is the case. They're figuring it all out at the same time we are. But every member of the crew, from the drill operator who's done this a thousand times, to the scientist doctor standing by, was confused. Everyone is left asking themselves the unavoidable question, is there a metal structure inside of this mesa? Now the team called whatever the drill was facing a quote, mysterious void containing an impenetrable object. The ranch manager, Thomas Winterton, has gone on record answering the following to the question, is there a UFO under the mesa? He responds, quote, there's definitely something unnatural in that hill. You can imagine that us drilling into it several hundred feet and pulling out metal that the University of Utah was intrigued. The professor there who analyzed it said he didn't think the material was natural. He didn't really see a way that it could be naturally occurring. I mean, it's metal. That would say that we've got an artificial object inside that hill. Having been all over the mesa myself, I I mean, it's very baffling. So there's definitely something artificial a couple of hundred feet in that hill. We leave you with one last story tonight. Addy Diaz is a member of the local Ute tribe and is Skinwalker Ranch's next-door neighbor. One night in 2021, her and her friend were bringing in groceries after a long day of working in errands. It was truly night, too. Summer was creeping into fall, and the days were beginning to shorten. By the time they got home from the store, the sky was full dark. As she took a load of groceries in, her friend called her back out. She was very excited about something and wanted Addy to look up at the sky. Now, her friend was also a local. Living next to the ranch gets you somewhat numb to high strangeness if you're not careful, but it meant her friend must really be seeing something wild, so she went out to join the fun. The fun ended when she crossed the threshold of her door, though. It was so quiet, a heavy quiet that was so uncanny it made itself immediately felt and known to all. You didn't have to be listening for it. It was just there or wasn't there. may sound cliche, but the absence of sound was deafening. When she looked up, she saw a bright light in the sky heading north. She's seen weird lights in the sky before, but this one stuck out to her. Sure, it was really bright, but the movement, it moved so differently. As she watched it, the light came to an abrupt and dead stop in midair. Addie knew it was coming next. The light would disappear. They always disappear once you see them, fading away into the night sky. Only this one didn't disappear. It didn't fade away or dissolve into some otherworldly portal. It stopped and paused, and then started north again, faster now. It accelerated more and more until finally it was gone. Not because it vanished, because it was too far away to see anymore. Addie said, My grandpa would talk about different anomalies he would see and things that would happen around the farm. One night, he was out in the four-wheeler, and he noticed the cows were looking up at the sky. And there was a big old bright ball very low to the ground. It rose up and then just disappeared. That was before he saw the skinwalker another time. My grandpa went out into the field, and he noticed a tall, dark figure just watching him cut hay. And each time he circled around the field, the thing would get closer and closer. He said it looked like it had a long cloak. And then when he got closer to it, it just vanished. Disappeared. I don't know why. Why?